Well, first of all, pharmacists, because we are very highly trained in clinical trials and the use drugs, most pharmacists both worldwide are very um, cautious about the use of drugs. And increasingly in the UK and GP practices, they'll have a practice pharmacist and the pharmacist will be the one responsible for all the drug monitoring, drug optimization, and something we call deprescribing, which is using fewer and fewer drugs to get an outcome. Hence why I call myself the pharmacist that gave up drugs. Okay, good morning, everyone. We have Dr. Graham Phillips in with us today. Um, welcome, thank you. I know it's uh, late in the UK, where I believe you are, so thanks for staying up with us. Um, no, it's not too late, it's uh, early evening, actually. Early evening, okay, well, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for doing this, by the way. And so, uh, no pleasure, and it's great to meet you. I've been following your channel for a while. Well, that's a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a very healthy one Time could, will tell. Depending, depending on who you talk to and what your perspective is well anyway well, well i'll tell you what if you wouldn't mind just take a moment to just uh, let folks folks know a little bit about you who you are uh, i know you have a background in pharmacy but uh if you want to expand upon that that'd be great sure and nice to meet you all um so i'm a community pharmacist uh an independent community pharmacist and um we're a bit of a boring pharmacy family, if you like. My dad's a pharmacist, my son's a pharmacist, so it's kind of in the blood. And it was always my ambition to have a single community pharmacy. And I ended up with a group of 10. And I also ended up with a very senior role in my profession. I helped establish what's now the Royal Pharmaceutical uh, Society of Great Britain, which is effectively the Royal College for Pharmacy. And I developed my group of pharmacies very much like a group practice of GPs or family physicians. And we were always interested in the cutting edge of practice and in, in not just talking about the future. I, and I was elected at the very senior level at in the representative, various representative bodies of the profession. And I've always been impressed by the politicians who uh, talk the talk, but also walk the walk. So I was always interested in, in doing both and creating models for the future. And along the way, uh, apart from the seniority that I engaged, that I was rewarded with, and quite a successful business, we ended up with a 10, million, 10 branches, 10 million pound turnover. Won lots of awards. But I also observed the following, that while I was busy spooning ever more medication into people, I wasn't really helping anyone, and the drugs bill was going up and up and up. And at the same time, my patients and clients were getting fatter and sicker. And in fact, that was the same was true for me. I was one of those fat kids and I became a fat adult and I followed all the guidance. Right. I understood the guidance and I was, you know, I, I didn't eat any red meat and I was, you know, I didn't have any salt in my on my food and I ate lots of healthy whole grains and none of it worked. Until one day I watched, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dr. Michael Mosley, I'm not sure how big he is in the States, um, but he's pretty big here and he's pretty big now in Australia. And I watched this program, which you can still find on the BBC, called Eat Fast and Live Longer. And one of the things he discussed was that during the Great Recession in America, when no one was, uh, people were literally starving, far from death rates going down, people were lived on average five years younger five years longer. And he had this, what he then called was the 5-2 diet, which was two 500 calorie days. So you're basically, your diet didn't change very much, but on two days a week, you'd eat 500 calories. And I thought I could do that. Nothing else was working. So I tried it and I very promptly lost 10 kilos and life improved. And I thought, well, hang about, none of this works with the understanding I have of the science. I lost too much weight too soon and I should be dead and none of it works. Now, the thing about pharmacy is it's a very wide ranging life science degree. So we get to learn microbiology, we, learn, we get to learn cell, cell biology, we get to learn not just the uh, action of drugs upon the body, but fundamental cell based processes. So I had the fundamental grounding in science that should enable me to go back and re-explore everything. And I realized the answer doesn't lie in statins and antihypertensives and antidepressants, but actually a lot of the science is based is basically around lifestyle. And as I always say, we're basically cavemen living in a space age. We're completely maladapted for our environment and in particular 
um, the food that we're eating and what I call the trifecta of evil, so sugar, carbs and processed foods. So having understood that, at about the same time, continual blood glucose monitors became more readily available. And one of my best friends, a guy called Jeremy, he was a multimillionaire, very successful health entrepreneur. But, um, and Jeremy by that stage was his late 50s, early 60s. And Jeremy had always had problems with blood pressure. He'd been hypertensive for 30 years. And he, he was a wealthy, successful guy, he didn't have a bad diet. But Jeremy being Jeremy, he wasn't content just to see the local family doctor. He'd been seeing the same leading cardiologist for 20 odd years. Every time he went back to see this doctor, they'd eat, this is the way you treat blood pressure. They either increase the dose or they increase the number of drugs. And he was now taking four drugs, uh, three drugs at maximal doses, and they'd recently added a fourth drug. So he was, uh, you know, taking huge numbers of doses. And yes, it was controlling his blood pressure, but he wasn't feeling very good. And I said, hey, Jim, you'll love this with an engineering background. Try this uh, continual blood glucose monitor. Let's see how we get on. Put the blood glucose monitor on. Next morning, massive sugar spike. So I sent him a little WhatsApp. Well, do you have for breakfast, Jim? And he said, oh, my usual morning, all brown. And I said, Jeremy, that's just sugar. He said, so what should I have for breakfast? And I said, have an omelet, you know, cheese omelet one day, avocado the next and so on. Oh, well, that'll affect my cholesterol, won't it? No, no, Jeremy, don't worry, you'll be fine. Anyway, four or five weeks passed. He lost 15 kilos. And his blood pressure, all of a sudden, which had gone worse and worse and worse for years, was now in his boots. He said, what do I do? And I said, well, I could do a medicines routine review, but go back and see this cardiologist. Long story short, he went to see back to see the guy he'd been seeing for 25, 30 years, who said to him, this is the, it, I've never in my entire professional life seen anything like this, overnight halved his medication. We're now five, six years on. Jeremy's 23 kilos lighter than he was. And remember, he's never been on a diet. He's not calorie counted. He's not been hungry. We simply changed the balance of his macros and got him off processed food. Not that he ate a great deal. And the only drug he's now on, having been on multiple doses for multiple drugs, he's now on, the only drug he's now taking is a statin. And that's because I can't convince him that he, can't, he doesn't need it. So that was my kind of first foray into this. But I'm a scientist and we all know that N equals one is completely meaningless, right? We all know someone who's got this fantastic story to tell that's revolutionized their life and doesn't work for anybody else. So it means nothing, but it was interesting. But I thought, okay, let's try this. And we tried the same technique with half a dozen different people and blow me down if I didn't get these amazing results. Waste came down, weight came down, blood pressure came down, mood improves, everything. Uh, and everything, all the sort of inflammatory related conditions improved as well. So I thought, hey, I'm onto something here. And from that was born the Prolongevity Programme. So that's a bit of a long answer, Sean, to a quick question, but uh, I hope it gives you some kind of background. No, that's that's wonderful. And and obviously, you know, many of us have seen similar similar results either in our own personal lives or, or with people we've, we've encountered, you know, as, as clinicians. And it is sort of, uh, you know, it seems like it would be, uh, you know, just a no kind of a no brainer thing. But we we still live in a place where, uh, you know, we're, we're not 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 only are we still utilizing those drugs, but there's more and more come out every day. Yeah. They cost more and more. I don't know how it works in the NHS, but in the United States, we have these drugs where people are, you know, thousands of dollars every month in, on these medications. Yeah. And we don't seem to sort of be looking at maybe this isn't the right answer. As as a pharmacist, you know, I mean, how and, and you've been doing this for a while. You mentioned it's been three generations. How has it? How has the, the the world of pharmacy changed from say when you first went in to maybe perhaps today? What kind of changes have you seen? Well, lots of the drugs we have these now. When I first qualified thirty five years ago, most of the common drugs there were no statins, right? Many of the anti diabetics, anti hypertensive. The, the vast overwhelming majority of the drugs that we use today and accept as the norm didn't exist. So we've seen this incredible um, flowering of the pharmaceutical industry, which is great, isn't it? If we could say that we're seeing a, a, an equivalent flowering of life expectancy and well-being, that'd be great. 
But what I've seen is, uh, and it, although it's worse in the States, we're very much on the same journey. If you look at um, the, the markers of healthy metabolism, only one in, I think, eight people, adults in the States you can regard as in, truly metabolically healthy. In other words, they've got none of the markers of metabolic syndrome. And I think the States is, the, is one of the highest consumers in the world of ultra-processed food. And there's a clear correlation between ultra-processed food and not just physical illness, but mental, poor mental health as well. Of course, um, we kind of, we, in the, we Brits kind of ape everything our American cousins do. So we're kind of on the same journey with you, but a bit farther behind. So in essence, I've seen a, a doubling and a redoubling, a re-redoubling of the drugs bill. And I've watched cancer rates, dementia rates, cut cancer rates, diabetes rates, doubling and redoubling at the same time. But don't knock it, it's a living. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly, a, it can be a good living. And a lot of people that do quite well in that, and they're happy to kind of continue the status quo because it's quite easy. Yeah. Um, you know, particularly with statins, if, if, and you know better than I do, but I think statins came in right around the late 80s, maybe around 1990 or something yeah. like that. And prior to that, they had cholesterol-lowering drugs as well that have been tried unsuccessfully to have any impact on cardiovascular outcomes. It was like, you know, yeah. you could lower cholesterol, but it didn't make yeah. any difference. And the statins, you know, and I know people talk about pleiotrophic effects or maybe it's an anti-inflammatory effect. But yeah. do, you, do you remember how that, because I remember when I, I was first in medical school, I graduated from college in 89, and I remember these new drugs come family physicians saying this should be put in the water we should put statins in the water everybody needs to be on it because yeah. you know let's do high um why do you why saying as a pharmacist that your friend who is worried about his cholesterol should not be on a statin what are you what are your concerns around that well i've also re-explored the evidence behind the statins and I'm not a cultist, right? So let me be very clear. There, pro there certainly are people who probably should be in a, a statin and will benefit. But there are a number of problems. Principle among these is, is the principle of science and contestability. So the way science works is I do an experiment. I describe in detail the scientific method. And I put up all the statistics that demonstrate the outcomes that I have from which I'm drawing my conclusions. And you, Sean, can look at everything I've put out there, reproduce it, and either prove that I'm, I have a basis and a legitimacy for what I'm saying or not. Now, historically, and this has um, got somewhat better, but historically, drug trials were conducted by pharma companies. And it's literally they were marking their own homework. And the result of that was that only the trials that showed the outcome that the drug companies wanted were ever published. And a group of physicians and pharmacists got together. Um, and I can, I can point you to a fantastic TED talk by Ben Goldacre, actually. Perhaps you put that in the show notes. Ben does a fantastic talk explaining bad science and how pharma companies for profit have perverted science. The, all the evidence around statins is held by a research group in Oxford, and they have sole control of the outcomes. So you, researchers can't access it, and they won't allow it on the grounds of confidentiality. This is fundamentally um, anti-science. And in the last 10 years, there's been a growing insistence that all the trials be published, both the positive ones and the negative ones. And what's really interesting, and there's not been a single published trial in the last 10 years since there was much more openness that shows a positive outcome from statins. That's number one. Even if you take the evidence that there is around the published data and you take it unskeptically and look at it, and we can come to the player trophic actions if, if you want. But here's the published evidence. If you've had, the, and there's a fantastic website I, can, I recommend everyone can look at, thennt.com, which again, we'll show in the show notes. And the principle here is you balance the numbers needed to treat against the numbers that's needed to harm. And medicine is always about that, right? You make a decision, at what point do I intervene? 
And how confident can I be that whatever I'm doing is doing more good than harm? And if you look at the NNT.com and look at statins, the vast majority of people, it will do them more harm than good. And that's based on the published evidence. What about if you had it took into account all the unpublished evidence? Which has made me a, sketin, a bit of a, a, a skeptic around statins and a lot of the other medications that we all rely upon. But it also made me realize that actually, if you get your lifestyle right, right and you understand the fundamental uh, disease processes uh, at the metabolic, at the, at the cellular and subcellular level, driven by our lifestyle, you don't need the drugs in the first place. So you let's deal with the root cause rather than dealing with the symptoms. Yeah, I've often said no one is suffering from a deficiency of a, of a pharmaceutical drug, with, with rare exception. You might look at a type 1 diabetic or something like that. But I mean, Absolutely, for the most part, yeah. none of us have metformin deficiencies or yeah. certain deficiencies yeah. or... Exactly, they don't exist. And I, I find it, you know, and I've mentioned this. I know Marsh Angle, who is the editor in chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, wrote a, wrote a book a few years ago, similar, saying that look, these these companies hide their data. It's not open for public record. Even the peer reviewers don't have access to it, which is yeah. just, it's it's insane to think that you could that that was being done and still considered, you know, trust the science or evidence based when the evidence is, as you mentioned, it's it's been tailored. It's been, you know, we're only going to show our good results and that yeah. clearly not in the best interest for, for you know, patients, I would say. Um, yeah. So how do you, I mean, again, you're in a career where, I mean, this is what pharmacists do that dispense drugs. How does that, how, how do you align yeah. ethically with that? How do you, how do you, how do you go to bed at night? So, there are a couple of things. Um, in the UK, pharmacy tends to have a broader and, and rather more clinical role than, than as much as it does in the States. So, Within our contract, there's lots of public health services. So we do medicines use review, help people get the mess from their medic medication. And one of the things I'm proudest of was I helped create something called Healthy Living Pharmacy. So the assumption, well, first of all, pharmacists, because we are very highly trained in clinical trials and the use of drugs, most pharmacists both worldwide are very um, cautious about the use of drugs. And increasingly in the UK and GP practices, they'll have a practice pharmacist and the pharmacist will be the one responsible for all the drug monitoring, drug optimization, and something we call deprescribing, which is using fewer and fewer drugs to get an outcome. Hence why I call myself the pharmacist that gave up drugs. Now, let me be very clear. Drugs can be life saving. They're really important. And, I, and, and I'm not encouraging people to unilaterally stop their medication. That would be utterly irresponsible. My issue is the balance here of over-reliance of drugs and the complete lack of understanding of the lifestyle causes. And I want to see my profession remodeled as I'd like to see your profession remodeled because we're all paid on the basis of perverse incentives. We kind of do what we're paid to do and we work within the system, change the system. I would like to see all health professionals educated in the root causes of illness. I'd like to see all health professionals aware that 100 plus years ago, most of the, what we, I now call the man-made diseases, so dementia, cardiovascular disease, uh, um, type two diabetes um, and cancer are basically man-made diseases that essentially didn't exist 100 to 120 years ago. If we understood that and we learned the history and we, understood, we were taught more of the cell metabolism and we were paid in a different way, and that's something that could absolutely happen, you'd see a, a mushrooming of public health and education and you'd save so much on the drugs bill and all the long-term consequences, we'd have affordable health care worldwide. So it's about how people are paid and it's the whole precept that's wrong. Health systems need to be rethought. Yeah, I, I, including my own, including pharmacy. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with the, the with the incentives are being in place in the wrong place. But I wonder, you know, people would say, you know, because you mentioned that you know these diseases didn't exist, and some people would say, well, the only reason they exist today is because people live a hell of a lot longer now than they yeah. did a hundred years ago, where life expectancy 40, 45, depending on yeah. what part of the world you are. And so the only reason we're getting heart disease and dementia and all these things is because we yeah. now we're living uh, 75, 80 years old. Oh, what is a what, what what would you say to Sort of and for that. most of my, let me be very clear, for most of my professional life, I drank the Kool-Aid, right? So I believed all of that. And if you go back and look at the evidence, so there were huge numbers of deaths in childbirth, huge numbers of deaths 
just due to starvation and war. And the simplest explanation that I've found is like this. If a woman has two children, one of those children lives to the age of 80 and one of them dies in childbirth, life expectancy is 40, right? Doesn't deny the fact that one of the children lived to 80. And actually, if you go back 100 years, there were not the same numbers, it's true, but there were plenty of people who lived into their 80s and beyond in good health and they didn't have these diseases. And again, if you look at the hunter-gatherer tribes who still live a very traditional lifestyle, you can find the same thing. Um, and um, there are lots of examples of this. So we've kind of been, it's the manipulation of data and the manipulation of statistics that leads us to believe that no one lived longer. But it is true to say that you pick any illness, any illness pretty much, and your risk of catching that illness, developing that illness does increase with time. So you become less resilient. There's truth in that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, it, it isn't hard to start to look up, look up, you know, Benjamin Franklin and Leonardo da Vinci, all these people that lived in their 80s. I mean, there's yeah. there's records and, you know, with, and, and there's thought on some of the anthropologic records that some of these skeletons are digging. Yeah, up. you so, could even yeah. go to Roman, back to Roman and Greek times and find people who are living into their 80s and 90s, not in huge numbers, but the point is they weren't ill. Yeah, yeah. That, that, and well, I, well, I guess it's... Some people say, well, we didn't have a way to diagnose them. I mean, everybody died of natural causes. I mean, that was, I think, you know, and, and again, I mean, obviously, if it, unless it's an infection or something like yeah. that, did they did they drop dead of a stroke or a pulmonary embolism? You probably didn't know, I mean, back then, I, I mean, to be honest, or maybe you did, I don't know. Um, what do you, so with with some of the things you've founded, um, are you getting much buy-in from other pharmacists? I mean, I, I know within the world of physicians, what I'm doing there, there's a number that are that are actually starting starting to say, wait a minute, maybe we can do things wrong. But it's it's very difficult when you're I know when they talk about it, it's hard to get someone to change their mind when their living depends upon thinking the other way. But absolutely, among other pharmacists, are there other people that that sort of sort of are echoing what you're saying? There absolutely are. Look, when you start out as a health professional, you don't start out thinking you're just going to spoon more and more medic medication into people while their health deteriorates, right? And unless, as a health professional, you want to really do some good, then you shouldn't be in it. So much as you need a, an income, most of, an awful lot of our job satisfaction comes from actually genuinely helping people and seeing a benefit. And once you see, once you understand this science and apply it in one or two cases and see people's, the light come back on into people's eyes. It's not particularly about the weight loss. It's, it's the reinvigoration. It's the, it's the youthfulness. It's the, you know, the zest for life that comes back into people's eyes. And it happens quite quickly. You can't unsee it. And it's impossible to go back to the old. I mean, I just can't go back to the old ways of practice because I can't deny the evidence of my own eyes and I get no satisfaction from it. So I want to see a remodeling of healthcare, all healthcare professions, because it's true equally to for dentistry, nursing, medicine, and pharmacy. But I have to be this way. And we're kind of, did, we're given all this training and then we end up in a blind alley, which in the end leads to massive demoralization because you kind of feel, well, I set out to do some good. I don't feel that I'm doing very much good. And, and it destroys your satisfaction in your profession. You know, you know, the, you know, and unless it's different in the UK, I mean, physicians are sort of, you know, with a few exceptions are the ones that are that are tasked with prescribing these medications, making those decisions. How often do you get a, a patient that comes in and maybe you have more information than, than, a, than a pharmacist in the United States might have? And they're given some medication and you're like, this is just insane. Or, I mean, how often is that happening to you? Almost every patient, to be honest, in the pharmacy. <laughs> Um, you know, I, and it's really depressing because what what you must not do and cannot do is just go out there and, you know, undermine the relationship between the patient and their health professional. That's not going to help anyone. What we try to do is if, if, is offer people alternatives because some people, they do just want to take the medication. They don't really want to be involved in the lifestyle. But um, I don't know if you have. Do you know David Unwin at all? Has he been on your channel? I, in fact, I talked to him. I think I talked to him last week. In fact, I talked oh, to right, okay. my wife, Jane, So he and I are great pals, and, and we're and both David heavily involved. Popped in for a visit. I, I've, I've met David several times. 
Wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. Yeah, wonderful guy. So, in fact, um, I'm going to the uh, Public Health Collaboration Conference uh, this coming weekend. David will be there. I'm, uh, like David, I'm a trustee of the Public Health Collaboration. And he's been able to show, even in a relatively poor part of the UK, where patients are not afford, able to afford, you know, organic or avocados, fantastic results. And I believe, as health professionals, we should give allow people the alternative to say look you can take the medication that's an option but if you'd like to try lifestyle change that's also an option and we'll support you whichever way you go and that's the way I think we should play it not to be judgmental but to be supportive it's interesting you know in the UK we have uh, you know a significant portion of our healthcare system is for profit we know that uh, farms industry is the largest lobby federal lobby there is they, they yeah. blow away everybody else by an order almost an order of magnitude at least triple or double the next highest uh, con- contributor do you have similar issues in the uk with uh, pharmacy uh, influencing the politicians and policy there less so so the whole lobbying system i'm not suggesting it it's perfect here and that everything in america is terrible i mean i, I absolutely don't believe believe that at all and i i like most brits i love um, American culture and I spend lots of time there friends and family there so I don't want to come across in in, in any way as anti-American or or, or anything or, or arrogant or any of those things um, I do think because we have nationalized health systems that the profit motive is less because you're less reliant on on the way that that system works so I think the same is true here but I think it's at a lower level so I think there's a greater freedom to practice professionally, and in some ways you can move more rapidly. What you'd mentioned, you you see every day <laughs> that you see, see things that you would probably disagree with. Had you, if you were the one making the decision, what are the common things you think that are medications you commonly see that probably could be better served by lifestyle? Yeah, so... It's essentially, it's all the diseases we most dread, right? And if you go back, what, 20 years, I'm sure you'll know this, people wouldn't even talk about cancer. They call it the big C. Because if you got the big C, there was nothing that we had done. It was just a result of poor genetic makeup and and you're going to die. And no one, so particularly men wouldn't even go and see the doctor because they were so frightened of a cancer diagnosis that they, they they didn't want to even see a doctor to be told. And now people feel much the same. Now more people live with cancer and survive it and die of something else than, than that it kills them. So there's been huge progress. And now the same concern is there with dementia. No one wants to know whether they've got dementia because there's nothing that can be done. Not true. So essentially, I see this as a what we might call metabolic syndrome. I don't know if you guys talk much about metabolic syndrome. Yeah. So if you understand that the same processes which lead to cardiovascular disease also lead to type 2 diabetes, also lead to cancer and also lead to dementia, those are are the diseases that people really dread. And they're also diseases that are bankrupting health systems worldwide. But as a subset of all those things, all the inflammatory diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune diseases, psoriasis, type 1 diabetes are also growing at a lower level, but they're also growing astronomically. And the question I would ask is this, is evolution so stupid that after 2 million years of evolution, we'll we'll develop immunity, autoimmunity to our own body? And why is it growing? Does that make sense? So... If you take a fundamentalist view of it, almost all the diseases that we dread and which are bankrupting health systems reside at some level within our lifestyle. And none of us are taught it. So it's pretty much everything. Yeah, I I share that. I think there's some common pathways that that all these diseases share for the most part, with with rare exception. You mentioned dementia, and and that's something that I, I, I don't think people understand the enormity of the problem and, and, and what's g- going to occur as we continue with this growing problem with metabolic disease, diabetes, so yeah. on and so forth. And we're going to have an immense dementia population to deal with, which, I mean, it's tough when someone's in your family has dementia. You've got to deal with that. Now, either you stick them in a home, which is very expensive, or you you take them under your wing, and then it's difficult for you to earn a living because you're 
constantly worrying about if, is, is mom going to burn the house down or something like that. Yep. It's a very challenging thing. You said, uh, interesting, I, I saw that the FDA approved a, a recent drug for Alzheimer's, despite, I think, 12 out of 13 of their, their consultants saying it doesn't work or it may be harmful. It was a particularly egregious decision by the FDA, wasn't it? And the number of resignations, I used to think of the FDA as a tough regulator. It feels to me like the FDA have been completely captured by the pharma industry, I regret to say. You kind of want to rely on your regulators, don't you? And I think the same is true, but to a lesser extent, to what we, to what we have here, which is NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, because they've approved the PCSK9 inhibitors on the basis of no evidence whatsoever. And even they admit there's no evidence it'll extend life, which is kind of the point. Yep. So I, it bothers me deeply that the FDA has been captured by Big Pharma because the FDA is a world leading organization that the whole of the world's health systems look, should be able to look up to. It's deeply, deeply disturbing, isn't it? Yeah, when we look at the funding for the FDA, I think something like 65% of their funding for drug approvals actually comes from pharmaceutical regulatory yeah. capture, and, and that it shouldn't exist. I mean, I think that should be a priority to say, look, we can't have regulators that are compromised or influenced. It doesn't serve the people they're supposed to be serving unless you say they're serving the pharmaceutical it, industries, which it looks it wouldn't be accepted. No, you're so right, Sean. It, it wouldn't be accepted in any other walk of life, would it? There'll be declarations of interest and people will be ruled out except in medicine, for reasons that completely escape me. But I can see the consequences. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, well, there's a lot of money to be made here. And so yeah. that's, that, that sort of, you just look at that and we always hear follow the money and it makes sense. But yeah, yeah. what, where do you uh, see, uh, are you optimistic about what you're doing or are you thinking it's just going to get more and more of the same and we're just going to kind of see more and more sick people uh, on and on and on? Um, do you know what? I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because I see what a small group of people have done. And I'm optimistic because I meet people like you, the guys from Diet Doctor. And I'm optimistic because in the end, I think the science has to win. And I'm optimistic because I think that a group of us are creating a social movement for change. And I'm optimistic because despite everything, in the end, the cigarette industry didn't win. I don't think sugar will ultimately win, even though it's won for the last hundred years. And I have to believe, do I not, that there's, there's a better alternative, because otherwise, what's the point? And that's why I think a group of us nationally and internationally need to come together and support each other through these bad times. I mean, uh, um, Tim Noakes is one of my heroes. And when you think, and I've had Gary Fetke on my podcast, all these guys who the system tried to annihilate because it didn't like the messages that was a threat to their business model. In the end, they win. And I do believe we'll win. The question is how many more unnecessary millions of deaths will, 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 will we tolerate before we win? You, you mentioned you think we need to reform or reframe the way, way we do healthcare. How does that look to you? What do you, what would you, what, you know, if you were the sort of the health czar or the, yeah. uh, the, I'm not sure what the top guy in the UK is called, uh, I, you know, the health minister. Yeah. Health minister. Yeah. If, how would yeah. that look to you? What so you I believe that the vast majority of health professionals in whatever system fundamentally with a few bad exceptions are altruistic at their heart. I think health professionals are fundamentally well motivated. And then they get perverted by the system and the paymasters. I also think the vast majority of us understand the fundamental underlying science. Um, and it wasn't, it's fairly recently I gave a talk to 120 GPs or family physicians that I was on. I did it with one where it was myself and David Unwin, there was another one when uh, myself and Asim Malho Malhotra, who I'm sure you also know. Yep. Yeah, no, I see. I can yep. tell you something. Health professionals are very, very bright people. And once they, once that, once they see the light and once they see a, a couple of examples in, in front of them, they, the change isn't slow, it's rapid. And I believe that we can lobby and we can get health professionals on board. And I'm seeing it, you know, if you went back, what, 20 years, keto, people who practice keto, and I'm not particularly a keto practitioner, 
but ketos were, were regarded as complete nutters, weren't they? I mean, just maniacs. And now I know in the States, the most Googled diet is keto diet. So it's changing, it's changing quite rapidly. And I believe that we're at a pivot point. And I think in the next 10 years, two fundamental things will reshape the practice of medicine. One is the un growing understand of the role, understanding of the role of the microbiome. And the other one is the understanding of insulin, insulin resistance, and that kind of playoff between insulin and glucagon and how that drives metabolic syndrome. So I, I generally think we're at a pivot point and God knows we have to be, because if we don't, the entire world will be diabetic and all health systems will be bust. Yeah, let's, when we talk, because we have, uh, I mean, we have a, a very myopic uh, view of health and it, it always sort of pains me when uh, I tell people I had a bunch of steak and the first question is, what's your cholesterol? And I, I think that's the yeah. wrong question. What, that's not even the right question. Absolutely. You know, I, I would say, what's my, what's my heart health like? And that, I think that's a better, better question to ask, but yeah, how do we, I mean, can we frame some better targets perhaps? I mean, how, I mean, if we're like, what should we, what should we be looking at? Should we do waste to height ratios? Should we, I mean, I, I have my thoughts on what, what would be good to target. Yeah. What, I'm interested to hear what yours are. Yeah. So I, I, I'd even take it even more of a helicopter view than that, Sean. Um, I'm 62, right? My kids are now having children. What's my objective? I want to be able to do everything with my grandchildren that I could do with my children. And I want to have an absolutely full and healthy life. I'm in a, a stage of life where I'm still working very hard, but I, you know, I'm no longer struggling just, just to survive and make ends meet. And, you know, I'm in a very happy relationship and I want to have a really full life. And that includes a full on sex life. Now, you know, when you're in your 20s, you don't think people in their 60s have sex. And when you get to 60, you probably assume that people in their 90s don't have sex. Um, and I think it's under discussed and I'm very happy to talk about it because actually it's part and parcel of life. And if and if a man is incapable of sustaining an, an erection, that tells you an awful lot about their cardiovascular health. So to me, it's about full on functionality and to die young at a very old age and to have, a, you know, to, to basically die in your sleep of nothing very much like they do in the blue zones. So that I would describe it in terms of functionality. Right. Then you get into the metrics, which is kind of behind your real question. For example, does blood pressure go up with age? No, doesn't have to. Why does it go up with age? Because we insult our cardiovascular system. What are the meaningful metrics? Well, you know, if you said in, a, in the length of a tweet, what's the one thing you should do to, to maximize your healthy life expectancy? It would, my answer would be secrete the minimum amount of insulin. But we don't measure insulin, do we? we generally speaking, we measure blood glucose, but we don't measure insulin. So there's some really basic and, and relatively cheap measures that we could get involved in. One is coronary artery calcium, which shows you, gives you a really good idea of what the state of your cardiovascular system is. Another one is a simple ratio between your HDL and cholesterol and your triglycerides. And the third one is HOMER IR, which is a measure of insulin resistance. And if we measured those metrics instead of other surrogate markers, then we could intervene in those people who really need it and not all those other people who don't. That would give you a great starting point, I think. Yeah, and I think that's, a, that's an important concept to, to intervene with people that need it. And, and I think we've saw that in, in recent times. But uh, you, let me, you mentioned that, you know, you, you, despite the fact that you think statins, the number needed to treat, skews it horribly towards risk and rather reward. Um, who are the people you think actually validly benefit from cholesterol reduction or statin usage? Um, I don't think anyone benefits from cholesterol reduction. And I'm, I just think part of the problem with medicine is that we mix up all these terms, right? Good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. There's no such thing as good cholesterol and bad cholesterol because there's only cholesterol. And cholesterol is a fundamental com component of our brains, our cell membranes, our hormones. And cholesterol is so important that virtually every single cell in the body makes its own cholesterol. So if you don't have it in the diet, your body just manufactures more. And if you have more in your diet, the body manufactures less. And I come back to evolutionary biology, which is either evolutionary biology of two million years is completely stupid, or there's a reason that we prioritize cholesterol. 
So the next question is, well, is there some kind of link between this cholesterol thing and cardiovascular disease? And the answer is yes, there is. And it's the way that cholesterol is transported around the body. And the way that I explain it is that your bloodstream is watery and cholesterol is oily. And you can't transplant wa wa water in oil. So we have these transport mechanisms, which you might describe as submarines, which transport the cholesterol around the body and other nutrients and deliver their cargoes. And when those lipids are deranged and oxidized, that is the cause of cardiovascular disease. So the, the, so the correct question we should be asking is, what wrecks your lipids? And at its most fundamental, unless you've got certain unusual syndromes, it's this trifecta of evil that I talk about, sugar, carbs, and processed food, combined with lack of exercise and sleep makes it worse. So let's focus on having healthy lipids and the root causes of that. And let's just forget this whole cholesterol thing because it's a complete sideshow. Because none of the drugs work in that way. We're still targeting the wrong thing. Just as in dementia, we're targeting our amyloid. And amyloid is not the root cause of the problem in the first place. So, yes, do starting to do something. Well, the evidence is on the published trials, if you had a primary event, in other words, a heart attack or a stroke, and you take a cholesterol, take a statin for the rest of your life, it will add five days to your life. That's the net benefit, five days. And you can make the decision, yeah, it's worth me taking a drug for the rest of my life to get five days. Or you might say, that doesn't really impress me very much. And then you might ask the question, well, if it's nothing to do with the cholesterol, Graham, what is it? And then we're into the, what you described as the pleiotropic actions. And we know that cholesterol, that statins are um, antioxidants in their, in their action. We also know that they have a potentially benefit, beneficial effect on the microbiome. So if you kind of went digging there, you'd probably come up with a whole different set of drugs that were much more effective. Yeah, that may be the next, and that may be the next place to go. I mean, you yeah, know, see, it's always if there's a benefit that we can uh, that we can confer from lifestyle, let's make a drug for it. You know, that seems to be the the mantra, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. What about you know? You mentioned the PCSK nine inhibitors, and for people that aren't familiar with those, those are like the super statins. They yeah, the get super your LDL cholesterol down. The son of statins, yeah, to, to they're the next big right. thing because all the statins are off patent, and big pharma's got to find another source of its income. And we see, you know, some of the some of the algorithms for people that are quote unquote statin resistant, where they just can't get their cholesterol down low enough. And yeah. these drugs rely we do that. Are we going to see some downstream potential of negative effects with this, like perhaps with neurocognitive diseases? What are your thoughts on the on the PCS long term use of PCSK9 well, inhibitors? If PCSK9 inhibitors are profound, they definitely reduce LDL right, low density lipoprotein, they definitely do that. So if you believe, and I don't, and I'm sure you don't, that cardiovascular disease is caused by LDL in the first place, you've got a clearly fantastic drug. But just, just look at the published trials. And the most important question I think we should all, all be asking is not does it lower my cholesterol, but does it increase my life expectancy, right? And the answer is not, none of the published trials have shown that it will extend your life expectancy, and neither do they reduce cardiovascular risk. That's based on the published trials, and there are very few trials published, and they're very short-term data. So based on the published trials, there's no net benefit. Why would you take them? Now, it may well be that over time, more sophisticated trials in particular groups of people will show benefit. And I wouldn't be in the least surprised if there isn't a subset of a subset for whom PCSK9 inhibitors turn out to be miraculous drugs. But it'll probably be 1% of the people who, for whom it's prescribed. So then you're in this numbers needed to treat against numbers needed to harm paradigm. And when you calculate that carefully, there are net benefits for some people, I would suspect. But based on the current trials, you, you can't really tease that apart. Yeah, and so I, I guess they're just building on previous knowledge saying, well, yeah, they're we based on the, the less LDL, the better. And this is better at lowering LDL than that is. So it must work. That's, you know, the example I was given, I'm talking to a lay audience, is the tribe, right? And they pray to the sun god. And every evening they pray to the sun god. And lo and behold, in the morning, the sun comes up. Now, you and I might not think that's cause and effect. And there you go. 
that's our, that's the kind of level of science of some of this stuff. Yeah, interestingly, and, and and maybe you have some perspective on this. If you look back historically, you know what the thresholds for prescribing the drugs are. They seem to be getting lower yeah. and lower and lower. I think yeah. cholesterol LDL total cholesterol used to be two hundred and forty milligrams per deciliter. Now it's two hundred, uh, yeah, or even yeah. lower, maybe one ninety. Yeah. Uh, you know, blood pressure is now recently reduced. The systolic number went from I think one forty down to one thirty. Yeah, you know, glucose. It used to be diabetes was the diagnosis of blood glucose is one forty fasting. Now it's one twenty six. Yeah, was that based on good science or was it based on hey we can sell more drugs? What are your that thoughts? That was based on good industry profits. I'm sorry. Um, since none of this has any real basis, you know, if you're a pharmaceutical company, your first duty is to shareholders' value, right? So that means you've got to keep growing your market. So either you innovate, you bring out new drugs like the PCSK9, or you find a way to grow your market share. And by lowering and lowering and lowering these thresholds, you are increasing and increasing and increasing the demand. And no one's looking at the evidential basis for it, or almost no one. Yeah, I mean, so we're at the point of doing more harm than good, more and more and more of that over time. It's, you know, it, I, I didn't want to believe it because, you know, probably like you, I was, I was conventionally trained. And I practiced conventionally for 25 years. And it's not easy after 25 years. And you don't start off, you know, you think you're doing your best for your patients. You're following all the guidelines and the algorithms. It's very, very hard to come to terms with maybe I've doing, been doing, despite everything I thought I knew and being a really good multi-award winning pharmacist, that you were doing more harm than good. That's not an easy thing to come to terms with, I don't think. Yeah, it is. It is challenging. And. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like at some point, but I mean, I, I think more, more and more physicians have to be sitting there looking at this, particularly once I've been practiced for a while and saying, this just does not make sense. And as yeah. you get into practice for a while and you continually see people not doing well, despite your efforts to prescribe more and more drugs or different drugs or, add, you know, balancing different drugs and, and interacting with different specialists, at some point you have to say, wait a minute, am I even, am I even doing anything that's making sense? And, and that's yeah. a... That's that's what you know. That's what happened to me. You know, as an orthopedist, I didn't really get into drugs very much. It wasn't really part. You know, there's a few we use, you know, pain medicine, a couple antibiotics, yeah. anti-inflammatory, but not much else. It wasn't really a drug-intensive field. It was mostly hit it with a hammer and you know, sauce something. And it's kind of fun <laughs> to be out there. Then I come to the realization that I'm treating chronic disease. It's just, it's just in a different form, and it's it's yeah. really it's really eye-opening when that occurs. Um, when you sort of had that sort of epiphany. I mean, how did, I mean, did you, were you, did you just start to see it everywhere? I mean, it's what I do. I mean, you look at it now, it's like, you just, you just like your entire world has changed. It's true, isn't it? You know, when you buy a particular car, all of a sudden, the only car you see is that car. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and it did. I, I was just so stunned when I saw the result with Jeremy and four or five other people, and I found the same results in myself. It was impossible to unsee it. And then you think, well, I need to understand the science here because it clearly isn't what I thought it was. And then you get, you start, you know, finding other, you know, I always talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. As seems to become a personal friend, David Unwin, Robert Lustig, Malcolm Kendrick. These, Gary Fecky, these absolutely pioneering, inspiring, Tim Noakes, these incredible individuals. And once you start to network with them, you're carried on on the crest of a wave of incredible dynamic people. And you then see it, you can adapt it and adopt it in your own practice. And it's just so incredibly exciting and fulfilling, which is why, you know, I'd lost my mojo as a pharmacist and now I've got it back in space like I've never had. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the, the common theme. And, and all of those people you've known, I've, I've interacted with on many occasions, with the exception of Robert Lutzig, who I've not had a chance to interview yet. But um, that, I think that's important aspect is, is any physicians or provi healthcare providers are listening to this. It does change your, the joy that you have in practice. I mean, I think that's as, as much benefit as the patients get. You, you equally get that back. I mean, and yeah. uh, just to elaborate on that anymore. I mean, how, I mean, again, as, as a pharmacist, you may not have quite the clinical role that a physician would directly, but you're still impacting people. How often do you get the feedback, the good feedback from that stuff? 
Well, with the cl my clients who are on the Prolongevity Programme, we're with them every week or two for a year. And so the answer to that is all the time. That's great. And the great one, the one that sits, stands out in my mind as such a great example, um, this guy and his family uh, become good friends. So he's a, a GP, a family physician. And he approached me with type 2 diabetes, very severe sleep apnea, out of control blood pressure, everything was going south. And his snoring was so severe that his wife wouldn't sleep with him anymore because she got no sleep. And after three months, his weight had come down, his blood pressure had come down, his psoriasis was resolved. But what really stands out in my mind was the day his wife said to me, thank you for giving me my husband back. Now, I never got that with the statins. And you probably got my husband keeps complaining about his legs hurting or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 wonderful. It really is, and I I, I fortunately get that that sort of thing most days. So it's really really cool. Yeah, it's the best thing, isn't it? Um, what you know, and again, a lot of people maybe listening to this are like in that situation that you described. They got all these medical issues. They're on a bunch of medications. Where do people have to be very careful? I mean, we we, we hear about you know diabetes drugs. You know, if you're on insulin or you know a met uh, or sulfon or sulfonuria. Yeah. What other drugs are really scary or dangerous or problematic to taper off? Because a lot of people, you know, they think, like you said, some people, you're not advising people just to cut things out because there's Never. serious harm. that can. What are, the, what are the big ones you have concerns with? Well, I think the greatest immediate concern are the, exactly those, the examples you've given. People are, who, I mean, you know, if you suddenly stop a statin or start a statin, you know, the benefits or the side effects take years. Um, the ones that are caused an acute hypo or a risk of ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, are the real risks. I mean, I can, there's almost no indication in my view for sulfonylureas now, ex except in a very specific, there's a debate about a very specific types of diabetes because, you know, diabetes isn't just type 1 or type 2, as, as you will be aware. There's, there's lots of different shades of grey. There's type one and a half now and a whole, you know, panoply of that. And people, so what you don't want to do if you're taking insulin or you're taking a sulfonyl urea is suddenly reduce your carbs. Now, of course, all my clients get a continual blood glucose monitor. So as we tease down their, their, the amount of carbs and sugar that they're taking, we can watch the sugars and they can watch the sugars change in real time. And we can make those adjustments. And we don't do things suddenly. I go gently because first and foremost, I must always safeguard and safety net my patients. There's um, a very good approach to de-prescribing. Um, I don't know if you know Campbell Murdoch at all. He's sort of part of our group. No, not familiar. I can I can send you the link. Um, there's two really good papers on de-prescribing on, on a very good approach to de-prescribing now, both of which have been published, which we can link to that talks about what the right approach is and how to do that safely. Yeah, I didn't learn any of that. In You're quite right. What you don't want to do is just stop all the drugs, you know, or suddenly yeah, change the diet and carry on with the drugs. You've, you've got to get that. You've got to finesse that. And that's where you do need the, the skill of a health professional, I think. For some odd reason in medical school, there wasn't much emphasis on deprescription of drugs. I'm not sure. I wonder why. Wonder yeah. what that is. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, interesting. Um, do you, oh, this is, uh, I had another thing I wanted to, to go into, but it's, it slipped my mind right now, but, um, where, um, for people and oh, she we're running out of time anyway, so that works well. Where do people, uh, go to find out more about the different, uh, uh things you're involved with? Maybe you have social media. I think you do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I must plug the charity of which I'm a trustee, the public health collaboration. And we have got our next conference next in the next 10 days. Um, the point about phcuk.org is that you can go there and all the information is evidence-based and it's all free. And there's all the conference uh, talks that have been there for the last three or four years. You can just pick it up for free. And I, that's a safe place where people can go. The other place I send people just gen, generally and um, genetically is dietdoctor.com. 
again, I think they're a great bunch of guys and we use their resources and we work closely with them. In terms of my prolong, my program, if you just remember the word prolongevity, so longevity with pro in front of it, prolongevity.co.uk. And my Twitter, ha Twitter handle is at Graham S. Phillips, so at G-R-A-H-A-M-S Phillips, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S. Or if you just Google Graham Phillips pharmacist or Graham Phillips prolongevity, you'll come across me. And we've got fairly active YouTubes and a Facebook group, Wellness with Prolongevity. You can join that for free. I'm going to search you out so I can make sure to follow. I'm easily, I'm easily found. Very good. Well, Graham, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I uh, wish you luck in what you're doing. Uh, maybe we can check back with you uh, down the road a little bit, see how things are progressing with uh, some of the things you're up to. Uh, it's a pleasure. For the rest of you folks, thank you very much. We'll be back tomorrow with another guest. And so thanks, everybody. Graham, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you all. Thanks a lot for the time.